Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today we are so excited to be speaking with scryer, esotericist, and scientist Harper Feist. Now, listeners, some of you out there may be wondering, what actually is scrying at its essence in magic and divination? What are the pitfalls and key tips for using candles, crystal spheres, obsidian mirrors, and so many other surfaces and materia in order to better interact with and develop relationships with spirits? Is scrying a naturally developing skill or can it be developed if you don't start with that skill? Well, with mm. these questions and so much more, Harper Feist is truly the best person to ask Harper, as I know so many of you listeners are familiar with already, but for those who would like a fuller picture as well, Harper is a master scryer, an esotericist, a scientist, an author, a historian, and so many other things. She's interested chiefly in magical and religious innovations of late antiquity and the use of these tools and methods today. In addition, Harper is also involved in the Ordo Templi Orientis, or the OTO, is an ordained priestess of the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, and also is the current interviewer of the U.S. Grand Lodge's official podcast, Thelema Now, which I know many of you listeners have heard. And also, Harper is a member of the AA. And Harper, something also you're familiar with, uh, teaches a well-received class on scrying at the Blackthorn School, in addition to so many other uh, publications and presentations and areas of expertise. So today, we're so honored because we're going to be diving deep into scrying, into science, discussing Harper's background, Harper's incredible authorship of works, including Eo Typhon, a hymnal, also discussing her essay, An Explanation of the Illumination in the Hagia Sophia's Original Dome, which is just fascinating. <laughs> and with all of that, asking Harper your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions and a huge thank you to each and every supporter of the podcast for not only your support, but for your awesome questions for Harper mm. as well. And so with all that being said, Harper Feist, Thank you so, so much for taking the time and coming on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Alex. I think this is going to be just a gas. The, the listener questions are, are amazing, and um, I'm, I'm super honored. And I also really like the, your use of the word uncorked. Ah, well, you know, hey. you, 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 make, you make all of your, your interview subjects feel like a bottle of fine wine whose time has come, you know? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I I never thought of it that way, but you're right. Each guest uh, in, in some ways is, is top shelf and is being mm. willing to be uncorked with specific areas, notes, bouquets, expertise. Mm. And I think you bring all of that if, if you know, if, if I may be so bold. Um, so mm. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it and it's long, it's long <laughs> overdue by the way. Oh my gosh. I mean, I've been following you and, and appreciating your work for like years at this point. And so mm. I'm the one who's honored truly. Oh, well then what took you so long, Alex? <laughs> well, uh -oh. you know, sometimes <laughs> one goes down one too many rabbit holes and then one, <laughs> one forgets that one's in space time. Although, mm. That didn't prevent something we'll talk about a little later is that did mm. not prevent you from actually remaining in my space time as well as a few magical colleagues as mm. well. So we can. Oh, um, yeah, that, that. Yes. I think we're going to have to talk about that. We will absolutely mm. have to talk about that and, <laughs> and, and so much more, Harper. But I think, mm -hmm. of course, the probably the best uh, for the few listeners who maybe have not. Uh, read about your early experience or heard about it is, you know, you are so accomplished uh, in the Malkuthian sphere, which we'll talk about, but also, of course, in the esoteric sphere. Can you share with the listeners, Harper, how do you first come to explore and immerse yourself in esotericism? Was was there like a specific moment in space time or was there a gradual unfolding? How did you how did you get drawn to magic and, and esotericism? Mm. 
Well, it, you know, I, I, the person I am now is the person I was as a child. I, I want to understand the world and I want to be um, a deep part of it. And I think when, uh, if oh, looking back, let's say it, to Junior Harper, like uh, maybe Harper is a six year old, I don't think, at least at that point, I differentiated between magical thinking and, and factual thinking. And uh, perhaps most, most six year olds don't. And and it turns out that even to me as as a, a scientist and whatever else I am, I don't distinguish so much. And in fact, I distinguish more about how I get to a conclusion than the conclusion itself. And um, maybe to say just a little bit more about that, in my mundane reality, I can think in a straight line. I can do math, and I can come to scientific conclusions, and I can build hardware. Um, I can do all those things. And in order to do that, I have to think in a straight line. But the re in the rest of my reality, I think it's not a good idea to think in a straight line. If I want to read your facial expressions, for example, um, that's not a linear thing. It's an instinctual thing. And so, you know, really what you're asking me is how do, how do those two modes of thinking relate? And for me, it's, it's a handoff and both modes are valuable. And maybe, maybe let, let me put a uh, cherry on that Sunday there. Um, most people in the Western world, uh, maybe even in the Eastern world are um, married to rational thinking and critical thinking, but um, we just we evolved to do both types of thinking and probably some types of impressions that we don't currently have words um, to to map around. We we developed this this way for a reason, and it's because irrational thought is very useful to us. Don't you think? that that's such a lovely way to put it exactly it's it's um I, I the way i think of it is you know we we're, we're so obsessed sometimes with esotericism trying to reduce things to a physical you know replicable cookie cutter approach but really instead of the laws of physics it's the laws of meaning and 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 ritual and space mm, that mm -hmm. that that are obey and i think you you've said it far better than i could um and yeah harper i mean that kind of gets to to your point this exact issue of evolving with both forms of thinking and then for the first time in in one's life experiencing quote unquote or interacting with a spirit for the first time um can you share a little bit of about that as you were growing up mm -hmm. and as you were going through this. Um, I know Ben McStefan, who's been on the podcast, uh, the uh, excellent scryer with Frater Ash and Chassan has shared about his early exposures and experiences. So what was that mm -hmm. like as you, that first time, can you walk us through that, that experience? Well, uh, God knows. So Ben Strider is a, is actually a close friend of mine and we have, have shared stories in abundance. So, of course, he's really precocious, really masterful. And my intra, uh, entree, let's say, into this field came later. Um, when I was the same age as he, he started to have his spiritual experiences, I was, um, hmm, I think I was running around trying to understand what decay was naturally. And when I was seven, maybe, and I think that's the age he he says that he had his first spirit encounter. Um, I was running around with little plastic bags full of of blood vessels that I'd extracted from a roast that my my mother made, and and I was putting them on my way to school so I could watch them um, decay. And and I didn't see that as as a scientific thing. I just saw that as this is how life works. And much later, um, I realized that uh, I could 
kind of read read people better than others. So instead of reading invisible people, I was reading visible people. And it turns out that those skills are so similar as to be nearly undistinguishable. My, f- my first formal encounter with a spirit was a spirit that um, I called, not, well, I, I saw, let's say, I saw in a Solomonic summoning with, with an exorcist who was following Dr. Rudd's uh, Theurgic Goetia instructions. And that the spirit seemed to me uh, kind of like a whiny person. And they mostly, they seem like people to me. I'm not really visual. So they, the fact that they don't look like humans doesn't bug me very much, <laughs> but they sound a lot like people. <laughs> and it, it, I can go into more detail of, about that story if you wish. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Should, I, should please, I? please do. Please do. The, the floor is yours. So this is um there there are some embarrassing parts to this story. Um the embarrassing part would be how uh, this whole thing got initiated and that is that I met this man I was faculty at the at a university in Denver chemistry right so I'm teaching physical chemistry to youngsters and critical thinking <laughs> which is funny. And I was lonely, and so I went on OkCupid, okay and I was looking for people who were, you know, similarly inclined. And I found one out of five hundred thousand fucking people to talk to. And this guy, we met at a bar, and we had a couple of drinks. And he said, "Hey Harper, have you ever seen a demon?" And and I'm like. Well, you know, I thought you were going to ask me what my sign was <laughs> or, you know, what's my favorite kind of cake. But I- instead, he wanted to know if I'd ever um, done this kind of working. And he never had. What he wanted to do was actually um, find a bunch of money. And of course, this is an, an a- a historically appropriate use of, of Solomonic demon conjuring you know, because plague and people burying cash and all that kind of stuff, et cetera. So he talked me into summoning a demon to help him find money. <laughs> and he he was a high-level mason in, in Boulder, in Boulder, Colorado. And so he had access to the local Masonic temple. And on early Saturday morning, we, we crept in there after having built all of the tools ourselves, including um, you know the the big circle on a piece of uh, of um, canvas, we he bought a sword. He I don't know if his belt was lion skin, you know, right? Who who knows? Anyway, he bought all the stuff, and I helped him do all these things. So we snuck into the Masonic temple, and we locked the doors. And we laid the circle out on the the, checker, the checkered floor, and he was absolutely terrified. Alex, he was like, Ugh, quivering, and he was afraid that something was going to happen. I, on the other hand, was afraid that I'd get caught in the Masonic Temple because girl, not supposed to be in there. And further, um, I was also, uh, you know, I was much more afraid of the Masons than anything else. So we started the conjuration and about two seconds in, it became really apparent that he wasn't going to be able to remember all the stuff he memorized because he was so scared. So he pulled out, he pulled out the script and he was reading the script and I was sitting at his feet inside the circle, triangle his way the hell over there. So he did the whole thing and I heard a noise from the other side of the Masonic Lodge, not in the triangle. So I told him that, hey, you know, is the demon supposed to show up in the triangle? <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So he got even more worried. But the demon showed up 
in in a chair at the very end of the Masonic Lodge, and it was um, shy and withdrawn and sounded an awful lot like my mom when my mom wants a phone call. You know, why have you never called me kind of thing? So, I had a conversation with a demon, which was not in the triangle where it was supposed to be, about finding treasure and that kind of thing. And the demon's like, oh, you know, gosh, you're talking to me, I'll help you. And and that was kind of the end of it. We closed things up and, and my quivering friend went away and he actually never, I never saw him again because I moved to Florida the very next day. Now, here's where things get really weird. Um, he calls me about two weeks later and he's like, you know, I was having a massage and the demon came to me. And I'm like, that's not supposed to happen. He's like, yeah, that's not supposed to happen. He was terrified. So, I took the sigil of the demon and I put it in, in the only metal container that I had, which was an orange metal toolbox. And I, and I went off and I got help, actually. And I talked to Frater Ashan at that point. And a series of other things happened. But that was my, f- my first encounter with, with the spirit. I never went looking. But it, it really turns out that um, the thing, uh, one of the m- a myriad of things I learned from that experience is just that I'm really porous. And I'm what I did with the, the spirit there, I'm doing with people all the time. And the, the fact that uh, we actually use a bunch of the same skills, people and communicating with people and demons is why I'm teaching the class. It's, it's all the same stuff. It's just communication. We ask questions and then we listen. And we listen with our eyes or our ears or our bodies or our smells. But we listen. And my, my class is, is about that largely and, and about using the imagination to help that process. But I don't, you know, that that first encounter, it showed me that communicating with demons is really not so different than talking with your boss, or getting a new account at a bank, or learning uh, how to how to cook an octopus from the guy at the fish store. You know, it's, we ask and we listen. Did you feel that um, when you were having this experience for the first time, and as you mentioned, you are not as visual, let's say, did mm-hmm. you, was there an internal, I, I think this is a question a lot of people might have too. Mm. Was there initially a, an internal register of the shift in, in presence? And then it was confirmed mm. by looking on the other side of the room and seeing the spirit in the chair, or, or can you walk us through some of the internal changes that you experienced? Uh-huh. What a great question. So, in the very first encounter, uh, I wouldn't say that all of this was really clear. I, I've kind of worked this out since. Um, I don't always see spirits. I don't think I always see people, actually, but I th- maybe that's a different question. But when um, when I am doing my work in circle, principally, I feel temperature changes and pressure and the pressure is always the first indication that something is happening. So, I feel pressure on my back, on my neck, um, sometimes in my, on, my, on the front part of my body. Uh, sometimes it's um, intrusive. But firstly, there's a body sensation that some, something weird is about to happen. And then there are ancillary um, let's say, sensory experiences that usually have to do with smell. And, you know, I do see things, um, but uh, more and more I don't care if I do. (laughs) Does that that make sense? And maybe all that stuff happened in the first time, but because I was actually afraid that the Masons were going to bash the doors down, um, (laughs) I wasn't paying attention. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that absolutely makes sense because, <laughs> you know, exactly you're, you're talking about the, this kind of full immersion in this, and this shift. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, especially, and I'm sure that in, in the course that you teach, you, you might get this question a lot from people mm -hmm. who are just starting out um, scrying or, or people who have maybe been uh, far along on the path about, okay, how do I know that what I'm experiencing is an external uh, register, as you say, mm. the pressure, sometimes intrusive, um, of various indications versus I'm in a circle, I'm nervous, it's my first ritual. How do I know <laughs> that I'm not somehow conjuring, as William Blake says, these mind forged manacles that I'm I'm already presetting things, you know, and I'm mm. presetting expectations. How do you, especially when you're first starting out? How do you differentiate or is it just, oh yeah, you immediately know when you feel that pressure, it's like, this is completely external from anything that I could ever even psychologically come up with. Oh, you know, people in my class are forever asking about this. And I think, you know, sometimes I wonder if my answer doesn't frustrate them because I really think it doesn't matter so much. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Scientifically, there's no separability, right? There's no way for me to say, this is me and this is not me. And that's, that's true of everything I do in esotericism as, in, as, as it is in science. And, and Heisenberg actually, I think, said, said it best. It's like, I'm not observing uh, nature. I'm observing myself in, in relationship to nature. That, that's a paraphrase, but I think it's really important. There's no separability. I have an experience um, with something. Is it me? Is it the something? It's it, it's the combination. Because uh, you know, it, all right. So let's pretend it. Let's pretend that we're going to actually do this to show the video. So above my head is this this styrofoam guy i'm pointing to him now and i make masks on this styrofoam form if i you know if i'm not looking at him is he still there does it matter i mean this question of um if a tree falls in the forest can it, and you're not there can you it doesn't make a sound no or yes that, it, these these things are 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 not clear and people need to give themselves permission to not care about it. It's an experience. It's an experience that gives us information. This is what we're looking for. It's not the tr the truth, capital T, because uh, you know uh, we could argue for a long time about if there's such thing as real truth. Um, for that, we'll have to turn the camera off and get alcohol. <laughs> But it, but no, I think in the end, it doesn't matter so much and people need to let themselves go about that. You know, if you're, t if you're tied to what the truth is, then you're, you might be denying yourselves the experience. It's the experience we want, the information we want. Is it, it does that ring true to you? And if not, fight, fight me. <laughs> fight me. Well, well. Our our boxing gloves are going in the same direction on this Harper um, because I totally agree. One of the things that I that I know I've shared about, but also many of the guests on the show is breaking through the expectation of this. To me, this is a uh, this is a stereotype that Solomonic ritualistic magicians get because people, I think on the outside who haven't practiced it say, Oh, this mm -hmm. is all, these are just people who are fetishizing, um, you know, post medieval Catholic ritualistic structures and they're not really delving into anything or, Oh, they have these unrealistic expectations that you must have a lion skin belt and you must have all the materia magica. Mm -hmm. And, and they're so petrified and so rigid. That's not at all the impression I get chatting with, obviously, practitioners like yourself, mm. but Frater Ashen Shasan, Dr. Stephen Skinner, uh, David Rankin, uh, who has written about this as well. I mean, there are so, so, so many. Jack Grail is another one. Um, there are so many people who exactly, you could line up 100 people 
all practicing the theurgy of uh, Goetia, uh, the you know, mm-hmm. second book of the Lamegaton's Goetia, of, of the Lamegaton, and you will have 100 different idiosyncratic, feedback-based, experience-based results. And, and that informs mm. your own practice. I, I totally agree with you on that. Mm. But that's, that's so similar. It's very similar to meeting somebody, right? So if we were all going to go and, and meet meet a celebrity, any celebrity, even, you know, Warren Buffett, Taylor Swift, it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We would all have, we would all have a different approach. We would all use different words. If we were all to come together at the end, we would describe them differently. Um, it, it, So, it's really important to know that my eyes don't work the same way that your eyes work. My nose doesn't work the same way your nose works. My brain certainly, you know, a wide variety of experiences um, has to do with um, our our personal past, our genetic past, what we've been trained to do. Our experiences are really different. And, and you know, to say, to be surprised that we all have different spiritual experiences is, is kind of silly because, um, you know, we can't even agree on what color a rock is. Uh, you know, why get wrapped around the axle around something like that, right? 100%. 100%. Yes, <laughs> it comes down to... It comes down to you. And this is even reflected in the grimoire literature. I mean, it even mm. says in many different cases. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, drawing spirits into crystals here, but, you know, it, it specifically says some of the questions are, you know, you summon, you pick this specific time, say, to summon a martial spirit or a Jovian spirit. But then one of the questions, once you have successful contact is, so what are the best times for you? What, what are the most appropriate mm. times? Like immediately based on, idiosyncratic right? individual feedback absolutely no this is like this is like you make a new friend and you're like hey when is it best for me to call you on the phone exactly exactly no, it's it, 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 it it's it, actually it's very useful to treat the spirits as though they are your friend until they're mm-hmm. not of course and that's a different thing but you know we're surrounded we're surrounded with invisible input all the time we should treat them with respect. We should listen before we talk. Um, you know, all all of the sort of communicative um, lessons that we learned in kindergarten apply here. Absolutely, it's a, it's, a, it's super important. You know, and and if we're going to go out and we're going to talk to spirits of any ilk, um, what we need to learn is not um, how to talk. We all know too much about that but how to listen. Yes. And that touches to me. And I'm, I'm thinking of the memory that you shared about your first experience about that relationship uh, and dichotomy, but also interrelationship between the operator and the scryer. And I'm, mm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to chatting about that. But one of the many things that I love about you, Harper, is you just, you just casually, you have so much experience and expertise, you just kind of casually drop things like, oh, when I was teaching chemistry, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to students. Mm-hmm. So I think before we continue in the vein of, you know, specific esoteric lessons, can you share with listeners? I, I just think this is one of many fascinating aspects in the menagerie that is your <laughs> experience. Um, in addition to everything else with your esoteric experience, you are a scientist. Can you share about with the listeners about your scientific background mm. and what is the relationship between the the knowledge, the wisdom, the application of the scientific method? How does that augment or complement or challenge your own esoteric experience? Mm. What a great question. Um, let me start the answer to that. Uh, as, as an 18-year-old undergraduate, so I didn't declare my uh, my major until I think I was a second semester junior. Uh, I sort of had to be forced to do it. And when I showed up at university, um, I was a little lost. Um, but I found myself in the sub basement of the of the library on the CU Boulder campus. Um, Norlin, which is the name of the library, is this enormous building, and it's 
got rabbit hole upon rabbit hole. And in the basement are other books that, you know, nobody's looked at for a long time. So imagine, if you will, dimly lit environment, vaguely smelling of mold. It's just a little bit cold. No one has been down there for a long time. And the sound, there's there's so many books and therefore, you know, lots of surface area that it there's a dull sound in the place. Automatically just it drew me like a magnet. And I hung around down there. Uh, you know, because it was cool and because I was lost and, um, and, you know, kind of this weird introverted person, too many people, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in the basement and I ran into Lynn Thorndike's collection called Magic and Experimental Science. I have literally never been the same. So w- w- even the name of the books should draw you in, Magic and science. And it turns out, of course, you know, the spoiler here is that, you know, until 200 years ago, those things were the same. Hmm. So, I appreciated that early in my career. And um, because of those books, I said, I'm going to be a historian. I'm going to study Elizabethan and Tudor England because John Dee. And it turns out, okay, then later someone introduced me to thermodynamics and I decided that math was just bitten. <laughs> and I became, I became a chemist. So, fast forward a bunch of years, um, I got a, a, a PhD degree in physical chemistry. I scaled up um, I scaled up a gas phase chemical laser, which people had been trying to do for a long time. I was momentarily famous for that. And um, so I study, um, let's say, unstable compounds, explosives, and and high-powered lasers. And that's what I've been doing for my whole career. Um, Harper Feist is, is not actually my real name. Everybody knows that. Uh, I need I need to hide behind a pseudo I, I needed. I don't think I need to anymore, but because I um worked on a security have worked on security clearance a bunch of times. So that's why I have one. And by now <laughs> it's like my real name. So just call me Harper. However, um science and, and magic are the same to me. Um and they became the same to me um, on a day in a very dark laboratory when I watched a, a single levitated aerosol droplet of sulfuric acid freeze when it warmed up. Right? Let, uh, just let that settle in. That's not supposed to happen, right? So I warmed it up, long term experiment, lots of lasers and frozen shit, and, and I loved it, right? So it's just just like ritual all the it, right it, all the prep in the beginning and all of the words in in the scientific journal all of the magic who has and doodads um it's really the same and at that moment i realized oh my gosh these two halves of my life are actually the same and, you know, for those scientific people out there, the reason that actually happened is because when you make sulfuric acid really cold, it turns into a glass. And when you warm it up, it crystallizes just like that. Ping! In this perfect array, it loses its, its symmetry. It was gorgeous beyond. In the same way that um, sitting in a mountain, sitting on a mountain and talking to the earth is beautiful in the same way that sitting inside a circle and talking to an invisible being is beautiful. They're the same, Alex. They're the same. Listeners, I, I hope you appreciate this as much as I do because the direct experience, but also the shattering the breaking of the misconceptions and and really Harper what I really appreciate you sh- uh, about many things with you sharing that is you are removing I think a lot of the 
a lot of the obstacles that people have when they first approach it. They they either feel like they have to systematize everything or they need to totally understand something when <laughs> it obviously mm-hmm. is a paradox in and of itself. Occult means hidden, right? These these things are just simply beyond our ken in many ways. And I think, Harper, this leads to a question which you might have already touched on. And the answer might mm-hmm. be it doesn't matter or, you know, it it really all is the same. But Listeners who hear your sh- excellent sharing of the scientific, your scientific background and your scientific approach, and also the experience you had with scrying might wonder, okay, so what the hell is scrying? I mean, what what is going on here? And of course, uh, online there's you know 65 trillion debates, but you know, <laughs> is this is this a physical manifestation that you see? Is this having an inner sight that's somehow replicated in you know neuronic patternings? Is it so? From your experience, Harper, what would you like listeners to know about what is scrying or if there even are any, what are some of the general mechanics, if you will, behind Mm. scrying? Hmm. Well, go ahead and ask 500 questions at once, Alex. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so so let's let's start with. um, Hmm. What is scrying? So in my class and in in my book, which I will eventually, you know, get get dealt with and submitted to Llewellyn of all places. So we we call this, uh, I call this, maybe some of my students do in following, an imaginative trance to get information not readily available. Now, so so that's super super different than. Um, I, it's super different than maybe what other people say, right? Because it it doesn't talk about who the spirits are, and we can talk about that if you want. Because I have opinions about that. There's no facts, but I have opinions, mm-hmm. and and it gets rid of uh, kind of the like new age uh, slickness of of the basic question. We use our minds to amplify little tiny signals that we get in our bodies to reach out and and get an answer to a question. And it's really very similar, since you were asking me about the similarities between science and and my occultic habits. (laughs) So, it's really similar, right? We use scientific equipment to look at phenomenology that's uh, somehow invisible to our ordinary senses. Science, scientists do this all the time. And in fact, other people, ordinary, completely mundane people do this too. They just don't recognize that they're doing it. We all use microscopes or glasses or whatever to in, increase our visual acumen. We listen to electronic things. We see electronic things. There's so much of our world that's not directly experienced through our our bodily senses. That's really what I'm talking about. So, insofar as scientists take invisible signals and amplify them with tools, scryers take very small sensory information and use the imagination to amplify it to something that's meaningful, to answer a question or to get to know a, a spirit, deity, ancestor, uh, you know, what have you. So, for now, that is my functioning definition of scrying. Now, people will be surprised, maybe, or maybe not, given what we've already talked about, that I think we've all evolved to do this work. And the thing that makes me think that is people, if no animal, no being, no plant has evolved, uh, does anything that it didn't evolve to do. The fact that we can do this essentially means that we are meant to. It's part of our our skill set, and we're constantly doing it with other people all the time. Can you read other people's minds, Alex? 
Well, if they vocalize intent, I can make excellent guesses, but I, I, I can't tap directly into their neural firings, if that's what, uh, that's what mm. you're asking. So t- tell me how you read someone's body language. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, if I'm talking to someone, seeing someone, and if there's a certain amount of bodily behavior going on, I, mm-hmm. I take it in via my senses. Uh, and mm-hmm. then I, I associate whatever that behavior is. I, I think subconsciously, I, I associate that with um, predetermined patterns of other things. In other words, if someone, mm. might, you know, I, I might, oh, this person seems angry or, oh, this person seems happy. And I'm associating that sensory input with past experience as well. Mm-hmm. But I also might be doing it, Harper, totally wrong and inefficiently. Wrong. <laughs> so so uh, let me actually translate what you just said. Please. <laughs> this is fun. Thanks for playing. What I think you're doing is you are making a story about what other people do that allows you to make sense out of their behavior, right? Mm, Yeah. Right? So, we're always making stories about things. And when I say imaginative trance, this is kind of where I'm headed with that, right? We, in the absence of data, people make stories. Right. If you have the, if somebody comes to you and says, Alex, I stole your car. And you're like, you stole my car. And they say, I stole, I, I came to your house at midnight last night. I snuck into your house. I grabbed your keys. I got into that. Um, let's pretend you have a Porsche. So I got, I got into your Porsche. (laughs) Okay. And I, I drove away because my best friend is hospitalized in St. Louis and I had no way to go. Mm. Okay. So in this case, you have the whole story and you're not like, I wonder why, you know, I, I wonder why Ted stole my car. Right. Absolutely. You don't, you don't have to make it up because you have the whole story, but we never have the whole story. So we're always like, did Ted steal my car because no, mm. Ted stole my car because he's an asshole. So, not that Ted's an asshole, but right. you know what I mean, right? So, we're constantly, we are met, we make meaning mm. out of the unexplained, <laughs> and then we tweak it to see if it's true. And and scrying is really the same, right? Mm. So, we go into uh, this imaginative trance, and we have an experience past the limits of our senses, past the limits of our rational thought. Mm. And then later we see if that's true. Crowley says, success is your proof. Mm. Does it work later? Then maybe there's some veracity there. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I think it's really important from, uh, you know, the scientific standpoint, we go and we get the data, we make an interpretation of the data mm-hmm. and then later we see if all of the rest of the data that comes actually supports our initial hypothesis that is an important part in in kind of what we're up to here mm. and and maybe not the classical definition or something right it's fascinating i mean to me it 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 gets to just the you know obviously the very famous quote right the the uh, which I'm going to totally butcher here. Uh, <laughs> no editing for a video, uh, but just that mm. the the universe is as large as your head, but you just don't know how big your head is. Um, mm. I, I'm thinking mm. of the hard the hard problem of consciousness that the best neuroscientists right now are still still mm. wrestling with. Um, actually, Harper, that makes total sense, and I think this leads to something you touched on just five minutes ago, which is that you have opinions on spirits and. and what they are, what this means. And and I know that we have some um, questions for you from listeners Mm -hmm. about specific kinds of spirits, but before we even get there, all right, so this is what scrying is. And if you see me typing here on my screen, I'm I'm an imaginative Mm -hmm. trance to get information that's not readily available. And so I just, Mm -hmm. I love, I love that. um, I love that definition. 
so if that is what scrying is, and it's a specific procedure designed to do that, to you know fill in some of the gaps, because we are telling each other stories, mm-hmm. um, th- those kind of internal narratives, then what is a spirit in your experience? What is that being sitting in the chair in the Masonic Lodge uh, with the Theurgia Goetia operation, <laughs> right? What is this? What are the spirits that you you know engage with on a regular basis? What what are those? Wow, you know, so there are a variety of ways to answer that question, but I think uh, let's let's go back to the basic definition. The spirits are firstly they're the sources of our information, and they're a kind of non-standard non. Uh, touchable, feelable, non, non. I don't want to say non nonsense, but you know, actually, that might work. You know, they're sources. They're sources of information, and and so we could get into the are they real? But I think it doesn't matter. The world, the world as we experience is is not real. Right. I mean, one of the things we, and, and uh, so I know I owe you an answer about what are the spirits. But first, I, I want to cast doubt on even the concept of what's real. Right. So I can see you through the means of all this electronic foo. Um, do you actually uh, look the way you do on screen? Do you have a short beard? Are you wearing a blue shirt? Do you have this uh, marvelously mischievous hairdo? Um, I, you know, I don't even know if that's accurate. Is that is that real? So further, let's let's disappear down this rabbit hole. So my eyes see only visible light. Humans call it visible light because humans' eyes can see it. It's four hundred to seven hundred nanometers. There is a whole bunch of different light on the UV end of it and on the infrared end of it. We see that much of the available bands of light. We hear only a tiny bit, like do- uh, so dogs hear much higher in frequency. Um, larger animals, especially those who are um, ocean going, they hear the lower frequencies. It turns out that as we age, the frequency at which we c- can hear things, it drops and all this stuff is actually flexible in in our own lifetime our skin um human human um sensory uh, touch touch is much less sensitive than a horse's skin much more sensitive than uh, you know a, a dog's skin under fur so i dare you alex and i dare anyone to tell me what is real Based on the fact that our sensory, uh, our our sense organs can only see that much of what's out there, we don't know what real is, and so I have bunches of scientific equipment. Do I know what real is? I know a, maybe a, a little. I I know ten percent more. We don't know what real is because we don't have the whole picture. So. If you doubt your senses, and you should, then it doesn't matter if spirits are real things or if the presence of the ancestors is real. You should just get rid of that word entirely and look for information. And it, it could be that spirits are, um, you know, as as. Jake infamously said, they're, um, they're the remnants of the restless dead. I love that. You know, rest in peace, St. Jake, for sure. And and ancestors, who are they? Are, do we resonate with them because of blood or because of passion or because of knowledge? But, you know, we can't know, but that should not bother us because we don't actually understand the truth and we don't know what real is. Does that, that make sense? Oh, totally. Because I, I yes, and, and you said it far more eloquently than I can, but something that I think about and we discussed um, 
before on the show is this that sometimes people say, ah, magic doesn't work, you know, Solomonic ritualistic magic, unless I, there's a physical confirmatory presence of a spirit. There's a physical, you know, Dr. Lasuskian mm. full manifest evocation to full manifestation. And yet the most important thing that you just touched on is did you get the source of information? Did it work? Well, I didn't, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything explicitly. Okay. Did, did, <laughs> did you issue a charge to the spirit and mm. did, was this accomplished? Th those should be the focus. And I think that's what you're saying is mm. that, you know, people are obsessed with, oh, I need this real um, confirmatory, say physical or audible or um, some kind of visual representation, which as mm. you've touched on is great if it happens, but is that the most important thing when the entire point of the ritual is getting information? And let me just say this. Mm. I love your definition. Let me pull it up here because it's just such a lovely, um, as William Blake says, marry, marrying the contraries of a, a beautiful, <laughs> magical, <laughs> magical and scientific uh, version because your definition, I love that. Spirits, you know, do spirits live in the... 28th dimension are they manifestations of our mind are they called deep from the you know the, the consciousness no you say spirits could be any of those things could be none of those things spirits they are the source of our information i just i really appreciate mm. i mm. really appreciate that that level set that you're giving people mm. and can i can i say something kind of pro provocative please most of us can't summon to physical complete physical appearance a real person Touche. Well mm. said. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you, yep. you, uh, so imagine you're at work and you run into someone in the hall and they're telling you about something fairly important. Let's say, um, you know, oh, okay, here, this happened to me not long ago. So the project is going to fail because X, Y, and Z. And af after X and Y, I'm, I am already gone from the conversation because I'm thinking, well, what's going to happen? And I'm already like spinning my own story. So mm. we can't even call into full physical manifestation our neighbor. Mm. No. And so, so I, I dig it. We all want to have these apex experiences that look like fucking Gandalf and CGI and all that. But but no, you know, until you can actually do that with your own kid or your cat, forget it. Excuse me, lion skin's not going to help that. Right. No. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Lion skin will fail you uh, when mm. you are in the office or in traffic or trying to summon mm. someone for a conversation or to get more information in the Malkuthian physical realm, let alone anything Mm. Yes, yesotic or above for using traditional right? association. And and yeah. and the fail the failure is not the person or the spirit or the ancestor or even, God forbid, the lion skin. It's right. us. It's us and our inability, utter inability at times to act as a conduit. Mm hmm mm. Ah, That is so lovely. And I I I know we have um some questions exploring some of the <laughs> some of these exact issues, including some of the the procedures, ways to make oneself more of a conduit, more of mm. a more of a, a vessel. Since Harper were on the topic of spirits as sources of information, mm. and since you just touched on may he rest in peace, uh, Saint Jake, uh, with mm -hmm. you know the remnants of the restless dead, uh, we have many many listener questions for you. Uh, Everyone, mm -hmm. in including myself, so excited uh, just that you are taking the time to chat. We have a listener question for you from uh, Tirza Viegas, who is asking mm -hmm. and saying, uh, Harper, is scrying typically done with non-human spirits? At this point, I almost exclusively work with my ancestors, Tirza says. The scryers mm -hmm. I've encountered only talk about working with other spirits. But I'm curious about learning more about this practice to deepen my communication with my ancestors. Mm. Well, there's no, there's no reason not to use all of this tech for for that purpose. I, I mean, I, you know, so probably we've answered all of these questions already, right? What we ought to be, you know, 
as people, as people who, as animals who've evolved to see and experience invisible as well as visible things, we should apply every tool to every situation to increase our the likelihood that we'll succeed. And and everything that I do for spirits, I also do for my son. I also do for the people who work for and with me. Um, I also do all of these things for my cats. It's a you know, so it it's not it it's not so much something that people should pull into ritual is something they should be doing, you know, all the time, you know, eat your Cheerios, learn how to listen. <laughs> I think, I think we can stop the pod. We, we, we won't obviously, <laughs> but that's, that's the, what a beautiful summation. Yeah. Chop wood and carry water. One of the things that mm. I, I think about mm-hmm. as well is it's like, you know, there, there's this, um, not, not an esotericism specifically, but I think in general, you're right there might be people kind of meander through life or go through it each day. I know I'm guilty of this where you just don't, mm. you just mm-hmm. don't appreciate it. You know, you don't appreciate the, I think Terrence McKenna said this, I'm not sure, but not only is the universe mm. stranger than we imagine reality, <laughs> but it's stranger than we can imagine. Ah, um, yes. You know, yes. and I think that like, oh, here I am, you know, let's say it's early in the morning. I'm, you know, drinking my coffee and, you know, the coffee mug is too, I don't know, I, I heat it up and it's too hot and I'm just annoyed. I'm like, wait a second. My hand is made out of millions of vibratory <laughs> atoms and valences with electrons. And there are these interactive abilities. And the only reason my hand can even touch this mug is not because the mug is solid, but because the force, the actual physical force of the atoms are preventing. And and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, reality, reality, even the most quote unquote mundane Uh, aspects is amazingly strange and beautiful and wonderful. And how often do I fail to appreciate it? So, you know, the the mystery there, it has nothing, and you put your finger square on it, Alex. And if we're going to stop the podcast, right, which we won't do, but, you know, we'll stop it because of what you said. You, what you just did was say, what I had to do in order to make the world magical was to get out of my own head, right? And And so, when we focus on others uh, uh, you know other people's communication or or my cat's communication oh my god my don't even get me started there i'll become instantly the crazy cat lady but um you know when we're listening to things that are not the voice in our head that's quacking um you know my cup is too hot fuck you universe that thing you know as soon as we're not doing that anymore the world is bigger Mm-hmm. And it's more interesting and it's more fun, you know, so I'm all about fun. My students know this about me, but it's also more magical. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we do that, we are connected. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so you, you said it, I didn't, right? Mm-hmm. Get out of, get, right? The thing that's in here, it absolutely great keeps the lungs going heart going all that mm. stuff but it does have a it, it it is a little selfish and if we can move move from the inside of our own head <clears throat> and start looking at um the experiences of other beings be they visible or invisible carnate or incarnate the the world instantly is a cooler place just like that one hundred percent. Instead of the the laws of physics, which are always ever present, it's shifting the laws of meaning inside our own mm-hmm. experience. You know, and mm-hmm. and I love that. And and I think Harper, I think this goes to the next question for you from Tirza Villegas, who um, and and this kind of touches on something you've said about you know how everybody's different. Everyone effectively has their own idiosyncratic approach with with scrying with magic. Um, and, uh, Tirza is asking and, and, and saying, mm-hmm. uh, how much of the skill 
is learned and how much is natural. Uh, Tirza says, mm. uh, I am a fantastic. So I've never been able to see once my eyes are closed, even though I'm an artist. I've been wondering if scrying could be a way to visually experience the spiritual explorations I've mm. only known through intuition and in rare cases, dreams. Fascinating mm. question. No, you know, I like that a lot, but I, I think the spoiler was issued a couple minutes ago when, I, when we were talking about the fact that I believe, and you know, I'm not a biologist, I confessed that before, but I think biologists would say we can't do anything that we didn't evolve to do. So, let's expand that a little bit. Um, what? Uh, and further, let, let me quote, Oh-sensei, right? Uh, the founder of Aikido, Morihei Oishiba says, what one, what one man, what one person can do, any person can do. We are, uh, we're all able to do this to some degree. Let's pretend it's like an athletic event. How shall we? So I'm a terrible runner. I run if I think I'm going to get hit by a car, actually. Shh, don't tell. Some some people will think poorly of me because of this, but it's the same, right? Given the, given that I have two legs and a and a heart that mostly works, I can run. Some people run a lot better than I do, but they practiced. Either that, or they had a lot of cars to run away from. <laughs> but you no, know, I mean, like they practiced and they had a coach and 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 they. Oh, and we all know, right? Given, given if if we're if we're abled in that way, we can run, and if we're not abled in that way, we can do other things. Mm -hmm. We are all capable of walking, running, moving in some way. Same with scrying. We're mm -hmm. we all can do it. If can we all do it to the same degree right now? No, but you know, there's practice and there's thinking about things. Um, and mm. so some people run without shoes and some people run with heel strike. Some people run with toe strike. We all have to discover the way in which we run. It, it It's, it's not very different. I am convinced. So several, several people who can't natively visualize things have come through my class and I won't say it was m my doing, but because of the questions that get asked in in our surrounding, they they come to the point where most of them actually do know that they're seeing things. It, it, and it, 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 this isn't things that I do. It's just questions that get get asked. You know, heel strike, toe strike, grass, pavement. We all have our own ways to do this, and the first thing that we all have to do is acknowledge our our uniqueness, mm -hmm. and work from there. Don't work from someone else's foundation, mm. Mm. right? We can all do this. Yeah, and hearing hearing you share your found your foundation, your idiosyncratic Harper Feistinian mm. foundation <laughs> is. Is 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 a very helpful wellspring, mm. I think, for I know myself and I I know the listeners to kind of draw their own um, mm. topographies before they venture forth or as they venture forth. And this next question actually might fall into this mm. category about you know pavement versus grass. Um, but I think it kind of gets to this point of if spirits are the source of our information or of information that is not read as readily available, how does that information hit? Does it depend upon your own? background and education and learning or uh, experience. And so to all of that, we have a listener question for you from McKinley mm. Valentine. And McKinley mm. is asking and saying, do spirits, Harper, typically make use of your default mental processing style in order to communicate? For example, if someone thinks in words, but not pictures, so they are mm. a fantastic, but visuals aren't their default mode, is it likely spirits will communicate in words rather than images? Or is it more based on the spirit's preferred communication style uh, versus the practitioner's? Yeah, so I, I love this question just beyond 
but I I bet you, Alex, and the list, the listeners too already are going to guess what I'm going to say. Like, of course, mm. but also, you know, we uh, here my uh, science hat back on. We can't separate those. Does the mm. spirit talk to us in ways that we can understand, or do we simply accept the input that we that we can process? Mm. <laughs> in- interesting, and right. then and then how would you know the difference, right? Because you don't mm. you don't know what you don't know if you get a certain feedback that that literally is the information mm. that you have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. But you know, this is this goes back to a, 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 another doesn't matter. We we mm. get the information, and we're gonna you know look at it later to see if if it's useful to us. So we can't tell the difference between the spirits speaking um, Greek to us because we actually understand Greek. Let's let's map map it that way. Do the spirits speak um, English to me because I'm a native English speaker, or do mm-hmm. I understand the words? Because uh, do, do they sound like English because I am? It's it, these are further inseparable questions. And so long as we're getting the information, um, it, that's actually an academic exercise and not a practical one. Mm. Interesting, but we still, if so long as we're getting our information and we can compare it with, uh, oh God, I'm going to say it, uh, reality, ah. then, you know, it, it's fine. And so let me tell a story about this. The only time I was ever paid to do a scrying ritual was when uh, I I was working with another magician who was paid to find some lost firearms. So the problem at hand was that a person that we mutually knew had lost a pair of dueling pistols, and he didn't know whether he'd just moved and they were gone. And he was worried that, I think this is, that I may have the details a little mixed up, it was a long time ago, but I think he was worried that his daughter's boyfriend had stolen them. And further, he thought they were loaded and he was worried, you know, about the legal ramifications of their loss. And so he came to this uh, other practitioner who came to me and said, we're going to summon a Solomonic demon to figure out where these things are because lost stuff, right? I, this is like t- the totally traditional reason to, to summon a Solomonic uh, entity. Mm-hmm. So we did that. And in trance, I saw uh, a very cluttered space, like boxes on boxes and junk and like hoarder like a hoarder television program, mm. really. And as I moved through that space, I saw a wooden box. So I saw, I, I, however that works. Um, I, I think it was kind of visual, but I also think it was tactile. So mm. I smelled the space and I felt the wood of the box and I, I remember in the trance, I opened the box and the pistols were inside. The internal surface of the box was red velvet and the dueling pistols were, you know, one pointed north and one pointed south. They were beautiful. And so that's what we reported. Uh, cluttered, hoardy space. Um, smell of hot dampness, mm. mold. And then the the presence of the firearms, and that's exactly how he found them. So I mm. got the information from the spirit, and we sent it out there into the world. And then much later, he came back and he said, "You know what? You were right." And I'm like, "I wasn't right." Okay, I got the right information from my invisible buddy. Mm. But that's the sort of um, corroboration. Mm that says, you know, is it real? Uh, let's not go there. Is it important? Yes. Is it interesting? Yes. 
Mm. Mm. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing, um, and, and the scientific part of me is super insulted by all this. <laughs> it's like, fuck it. <laughs> what? Yeah, how do you, you know, just, just I, you know, I just have to ask, because as you say, as you said many times now, look, there's, there's really no separation, and one embraces mm. both of these methods, but when you do have those moments of like, okay, you know. <laughs> I'm in the lab, right? Scientific method, hard, rigid, materialistic, mm. you know, evidence-based, must must be able to replicate given the recreation of specific conditions under experiment. You know, all of the mm. classic um, <laughs> from Newtonian <laughs> onwards, right? And then yeah. this happens where it's it's spirits as sources of information. What what are some of the? Can you? Give listeners the maybe a few snippets of the conversation between what your scientific brain might be yelling at your <laughs> magical side, or what, what is going on? There? Um, you know that used to be more difficult for me than it is now. But at at that time, I thought, Alex, I thought I'm losing my mind, and then I thought, Wow, nah, not really, no. And and it all has, uh, and I processed this in, um, years later, five maybe years later, mm. when I was uh, actually thinking about okay, so here I am, um, I'm a I'm a professor and I'm teaching people about chemistry, and I also had this group of undergraduates that I was teaching critical thinking to, okay. and that's like you know don't be an idiot when you vote, and don't be a sucker on the internet, and and like you know figure out how to negotiate the the modern world without without kind of losing yourself yeah. was was that <laughs> and so here i i am teaching people how to how to think critically and how to think in a straight line basically mm -hmm. and um it was maybe 5 years ago that i discovered that um all right the ancient greeks they had uh, and and so Right, I I've taken philosophy as an undergraduate. I know about the syllogisms and I know about brutal linear thinking, but the Greeks had a very specific way of thinking called mania. They wouldn't have called it a way of thinking, but um, they could be really irrational. And E.R. Dodds, had put, uh, he wrote a book called The Greeks and the Irrational that, that describes that, right? And mm -hmm. so, the ecstatic and the improbable and all of this stuff, it had a real place in antiquity that we don't have now. Hmm. We, you know, we in modern day reality, we, we fail to give this uh, place at the table. But when you do, you have permission to not worry so much about um, thinking that is is best relegated to um, calculating, um, gosh, how much paint it takes to paint this paint my office, or how to use a map. You have mm -hmm. you've been you give yourself permission to use your intuition, to use your body, to be mm -hmm. an animal, it, and it opens all these doors where suddenly these things are no longer in violent conflict. But they are useful together, mm -hmm. and I th and I think you know for me personally, huge discovery, mm. huge mm. discovery. It lets me it, it lets me be who I am and not not <laughs> be too unhappy about it. <laughs> Maybe that's so great. And and how to your point, how ironic, right? That the um you know, oh, the Greeks and yeah, exact brutal linear thinking and the perfection of logic. Right. Mm -hmm. But they mm -hmm. also had this entire language that allowed, and I love that phrase about giving yourself permission to use intuition or your body. Like, so yes, there, there was Matt pure, right. Mathematical geometric syllogisms, all this, you know, excellent rationality and, and all mm -hmm. that. But then there was the, there there's deep lessons that these things can't touch that can only be found by embracing the laws of meaning, if you will, as opposed to right you know, the and, laws and of physics. And and okay, so an entire part of my life uh, uh, worships Newton and Einstein and Boltzmann and Heisenberg and all that kind of stuff. But mm. then the other side is Plato, right? So 
Um, the Phaedrus talks all about this. This is um, thinking irrationally was practiced in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece, and everything that we know about, um, you know, the the PGM and Homer and everything that comes down to us from a kind of classical period. Not that the PGM was classical, mind you, but even, you know, this bleeds into Christianity. You can read it in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and our absolute addiction to rational thinking is very modern, and it doesn't mm -hmm. suit us very well. Mm -hmm. We, yeah. we need we need something that we've we've jettisoned for the moment and it would really it, it behooves us to reclaim this because it it makes us into complete people mm -hmm. we need it mm -hmm. yeah and we, uh, you know scry scrying and occultism and all that aside we need it oh yeah oh my goodness and and this this will uh in a few questions from now this actually to me it touches on directly something you've actually written about extensively, but I'm in particular thinking of an essay in which you collaborated with Peter Mark Adams. You know, you look at the mm. Hi Hagia Sophia, for example, and sure, from a purely geometrical, you know, brutal mathematical, <laughs> you know, all the rock and place. Sure, it's it's it has all those elements, but yet embedded. And I think I, I, this is an interpretation of, for me, of what you just said, but amid that, right, amid swimming in the ocean of this kind of hard mathematical, you know, geometric, you know, linear thinking mm. is encrypted within that, embedded within it is this rich, beautiful, nonlinear, intuitive mm. alphabet code that it's just right there if we only can see it. I don't know well, if that's a fair it, way to put it, but no, I, you know, I, I I like that, but but let's separate it. Um, let's separate it with a question, mm. I, and so I've never that what you just said made made me think about this. I've never actually described it in this way. So the essay actually is um, very linear, and it describes mm. uh, how how the light actually works inside the original dome of the Hagia Sophia, which of course not, none of us has ever seen. The whole place fell down, um, you know, 80 years after its construction because of structural instability. The, and the structural instability was probably chosen because it created this, this beautiful transformative lighting. Now, so the, the questions that I was just talking about, so there is the how, how did Harper, how did the light manifest itself in these descriptions of the original Hagia Sophia? Well, okay, um, so I present a whole bunch of geometry and, and very linear thinking there, but why? Why did they do that? And the whole, actually, the whole of the Peter Mark Adams book is the answer to the why question. Mm -hmm. They chose to build this dome that they knew, they had to know, was unstable. They had to know it wouldn't last. They had to know that any earthquake would knock it over because all of the architectural um, smarts were there at the time. They knew they knew what they were risking to make that absolutely amazing lighting that's described. And they took the risk. That's the why. So there's the how, which is rational, and there's the why, which is the irrational and the mysterious and the what is absolutely necessary for us to be completely human. It's the why. Again, we're coming back to that theme of... of uh, marrying the contraries of of bathing mm -hmm. in the paradox. I'm sure there's many different ways that that one could uh, one could phrase it. By the way, listeners, uh, uh, just for some extra context, this is Harper's excellent essay, which is in in the uh, as an appendix to Peter Mark Adams in his book uh, Sanctum of Kronos: Spiritual Descent mm -hmm. in the Age of Tyranny and. Uh, Harper's excellent essay is entitled An Explanation of the Illumination in the Hagia Sophia's Original 
dome. So we'll please check out the um, the podcast and mm. video descriptions as well to um, pick mm. a, pick up a copy of that too. Um, and I think I think Harper, this really touches on. I mean, we have um, many more listener questions for you about kind of the the mechanics behind it. But in terms of your last point of um, going back to ancient ancient Greece, but the allowance and the permission of intuition. Earlier, you touched on um, being aware of external things, like for instance, the the pressure that might change or the kind of uh, physical aspects that are recalibrated before an appearance of a spirit. McKinley Valentine has a question for you about going the other way, and I'm curious your thoughts on it. So McKinley says, People talk about discernment and scrying in the sense of don't mistake messages coming from your own ego or anxiety as being messages from spirits. But what about discernment in the other direction? How do you avoid dismissing messages from spirits because you think that they're just your own thoughts or not even noticing the messages Mm. because they blend in with your own stream of consciousness? Oh, well, okay. So that's a a beautiful question, but... He, the the quick answer is accept everything mm. and then and fish it out later right so one one mm. of the things that i'm i'm kind of working on for my book right, right now is the fact that when we um hmm, when we innovate let's say there are two at least two steps but let's let's fiddle with the two steps so the guy who invented velcro he was an engineer i think he was a swiss guy I mean, doesn't this sound like a kind of German Swiss thing? So he's wandering around in the, you know, in the in the woods, and these burrs get on his dog, and he's like outraged because he's got to pull these burrs off the dumb dog. But he looks at them, and they're complicated, and he doesn't really understand why they're so damn hard to get off the dog. So he takes he takes the burrs, and he looks at them under a microscope, and he determines that there are spikes all over them. Okay, so that is the observation. And according to McKinley's question, this is everything. So there's what's going on in my head, um, the fact that my heart is going too fast, the fact it's cold in here now, and the weird voice that's behind behind my back. Um, you know, all, all of this together, that's the observation. That's the burr has spikes on it, and I'm pissed because it's hard to get off the dog. Mm observation but then there's what we do with it later so mm. he took the uh, <laughs> this, this crazy system with all these spikes all over it it's a stupid dog and he looks at it under a microscope and he understands how it happens like i said and he scales it such that you know he realizes that you could actually make one surface that's a dog and one surface surface it's a burr and they stick together reversibly and you could go and make mm. velcro okay so get all of the observation the whole thing don't don't peel anything away this is the purpose of the scientific or the the magical journal and the scientific notebook take all the notes mm. record everything you know every little detail planetary day plan- planetary day planetary hour um what the weather's like what you're wearing what you had for lunch do the whole crowley thing right i had i had limoncello for dessert even whole crowley thing and later watch what happens and see what part of it matters the the, the whole this whole source thing uh, i think ultimately if it were separable It would be interesting, but it's not. So we have to separate it. Observation results or, um, you know, what happens later, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the way I think about it. I'm I'm sure there are 100,000 other ways to think about it. But for me, this rings true. And the the whole model of, um, you know, the creation of Velcro has absolutely dirt pedestrian as that sounds it it applies yes it applies very very good pun there with applying and velcro and peeling things on and off (laughs) i didn't know if that um i 
I totally agree. It does <laughs> apply. Uh, and I, I, I love that. What I'm, what I'm getting Harper from what you're saying is, and, and this is something that I certainly, I, I remember years ago when I first started as well. And today it's something I need to watch out for, which is, hmm. would it be fair to say this? Another way of saying how you said it so eloquently would just be as well. Don't preemptively mm. just dismiss information because you have a preconceived notion of this needs to come from this source or this needs to right. come from that. Take take all of the before you carve your Michelangelo or some kind of Davidic <laughs> statue, take all take all the chunks of raw marble in and then mm. later on you can start crafting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that that's right. It's it's like the the temptation to censor things. I I think mm. all, all right. We want to have an experience. We have expectations about what that experience will be like, but that's actually censorship in a way, and so we should be very careful about that. And and the way to get around that is is just to, to record everything, think about it later. You know, like Mr. Velcro, <laughs> you don't have to, to think, you don't have to choose what's, uh, you know, what's important at the moment. Think about that later. It, it, that if we can separate anything, we can separate the observation and the results. So do that. Take all of the observations. Take, take everything in. Okay. So. I love that. And, and listeners, if you are um, as appreciative as I am, I think this is really, really just so key to remember because I, I know for me, that's something that one needs to let go of are those mind forged manacles before going into a ritual mm. or working with a scryer or, you know, any of those esoteric procedures. Um Scientists, as uh, Harper knows, uh, better than anyone, have beakers and lab equipment and laser precision measurement tools and you know specific uh, instruments, <laughs> scientific instruments. Mm -hmm. One could argue uh, that scrying might also have its own materia. And so this next question um, for you, Harper, is from uh, Aaron. And Aaron is asking and mm -hmm. saying, can you, Harper, speak about the significance of the actual scrying surface to use and how important it might be to use a consecrated or purpose specific surface like a black mirror versus something like the surface of a natural body of water uh, a, mm. a crystal sphere uh you know can you talk about the the surfaces or of course one thinks of ancient practices with oil and thumbnail scrying i mean what <laughs> what what about the services? Do they do they matter? Is there a difference? Uh, what what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, so I'm I'm pretty agnostic about those things. But hmm. so this gets into kind of preparation for any work, right? right? Any any work, including science and scrying and um, cooking and uh, intimate behavior, all of these things. So. If it's important to the practitioner, then it's important. So, uh, so there's a, there's a PGM spell, and it, it's the Typhonic initiation one. And at the end, right? The the reason that we do the Typhonic initiation spell in the PGM is because it allows you to to basically scry anything anywhere. All right, so several of us have done this. It's uh, it, it's in some ways sort of severe, but at the end, the um, the PGM talks about scrying into a bowl of water from a spring, or a bowl of water from the ocean, or a bowl of water from a well, hmm. and each one of those things has a, a series of characteristics associated with it that will do something slightly different. Hmm. True or false? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so it, right. so it's right. it's up it's up to the practitioner like so this this is my iPhone and and here look you can see me in it and now let's see let's see if we can see Alex in it. Oops. Alex oh there's Alex. <laughs> yep, there you go. Wow. <laughs> this you know my iPhone surface 
oops, <laughs> except now, um, it, it, it's a great scrying surface. And, and mm. the, you know, actually, if you look down the bore of a glass, also, if you, if in the dark, you have a piece of anything, anything mm. will work. The point is to get yourself out of your own head and ask a question. So to me, all of that stuff is agnostic. But if a if a practitioner says, "I love my black mirror," then it's the perfect thing. And if the and if the practitioner says, "My Peloton screen is the best thing," then it's the perfect thing. Mm-hmm. And if if you know if you're really tied into some ritual system and it and you. Let's pretend we're tri- trithemians for now, and we have, uh, you know, a, a scrying sphere the size of a small orange, and with a, you know, with a golden bear on the back. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Do you need it to do any work? No. No. Mm-hmm. I mean, what is what is the actual what is the actual tool we're using to do the work? Hmm. The body, the eyes, the mind, the nose, the skin. You are the instrument. You are the beaker, if you will. You are the experimentation for Mm -hmm. the most effective communication. I I love that, Mm -hmm. Harper, because... It 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 again breaks the misconceptions. It it's it's just like someone who's obsessed with, I must have a physical manifestation of a spirit. But then it's like, okay, to me that's more small picture. The big picture is, what did you? What was your question? What did you ask? Mm-hmm. Did it manifest yeah. in the time period that you gave? You know, did you did did you do that? It sounds like you're saying with scrying, it's it's the same thing. It's don't don't be mm. mired in this kind of maybe more small picture thinking instead of mm. it's like, okay, no matter what it is, black obsidian mirror, crystal sphere, <laughs> finger, fingernail, looking down the mm. a wine glass. Um, yeah, there could yeah. be anything, but it's like, but what is your question? What are, what are you, what are you seeking mm. from the sources of information, the spirits? Right. Mm. Yeah, ex- exactly. I think the the focus on, on the the actual surface is is really interesting, but I would encourage people to have that be an aesthetic question rather than a functional one. What do you mm-hmm. like to see? What it, what what encourages your creativity? What what opens your what opens your mind? Mm-hmm. What removes distraction? Let that be an aesthetic choice rather than than thinking it's going to drive the whole experience. What's going to drive the whole experience is you and the question Mm -hmm. together. Ah, That is so great. That is so great. Harper, really appreciate that. Um, Mm. You know, as well, um, we have some questions that I think go back to your first uh, story that you shared about being in the Masonic Lodge. (laughs) Um, um, But but before we get to those, here's here's one that I think, and I'm sure you discussed this in in your course, and I'm I'm looking forward to chatting about your course, and uh, listeners can check out the uh, links below for all of of Harper's uh, excellent publications and and course material. Um, can you sketch out? Because I know that this is such a broad topic, but can you sketch out, Harper? What are some of the biggest pitfalls or mistakes or assumptions, maybe assumptions mm, that, mm. that people new to scry and often fall into and how can they, how can they avoid those assumptions or Mm-mm. pitfalls? Is, is, is there anything that you kind of see over and over again or something that you find yourself sharing it about again and again? Mm. Well, I, you know, I think the primary stumbling block that, that many people have is mm. they think they're, bad at it when of course we're you know if if you adopt my definition of the whole thing we're doing this all the time and it's just right. you, you know so for us to extend this to an invisible system it's it is just that it's an extension it's not something groundbreaking and brand new um if we apply the way that we handle ourselves in front of other people um that's a really good start. And so when when people say, oh, I'm new at this, or oh, I 
I'm bad at this or, um, you know, uh, that they're, they're assuming a lot there mm. because, you know, we're, we're doing this intensive listening all the time in, intensive listening in response to a question. We do that all the time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, <laughs> you know, the, the folks, the folks in my current cohort of the class, which just started and the registration is still open, but we're already talking about this, uh, you know, the notion that somehow what we see in movies is real. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, and, and so I, I super love this. Um, I, I love this. Maybe this is maybe too much of a confession, but I'm a, I'm a cultural imbecile. Like I, I don't do movies really. <laughs> and I, so I, I listen to pop music sometimes. I read, I, you know, I constantly read, but um, I don't, I'm not a movie person. So when mm. people come and they say, I want to have a spiritual experience that's like CGI. They don't usually use those words, by the way. <laughs> Right. But um, you know, uh, that's we shouldn't we shouldn't expect things because we've seen them in a movie, including right. like um, I'm gonna have my pants scared off, including um, Gandalf falling off the off the bridge in Moria and screaming, "Fly, you fools!" Um, you know, these right. things have never happened to me personally, so. I think it, it would it would really be nice if people didn't equate their spiritual lives with that sort of media experience. I think that would be really useful because it gets into all these comparisons where you know nobody nobody is going to have that experience. Nobody nobody's going to have you know five five thousand horsemen or fifty thousand horsemen at Helm's Deep on their way to the office. Right. And so we should we shouldn't expect to have the exorcist experience the first time we we perform a, a Solomonic summoning ritual. No. Yeah. Okay, okay, so those of us in the know have heard the story about Cellini filling the the um the Colosseum in Rome with demons. Um probably we shouldn't expect that either. Right. You know, at least at least that's documented. But uh, you know, the uh, kind of the coherent theme through all this is expectations, though. And if you expect too much, then then you're not open to what's really happening. I think mm. your your head is already full of what you think the answer is, so there is no question. Right. Right. It's already full of mm. of all this all all of this preconceived information. When, as you said at the at the very beginning of our interview, that the real key is not filling your head with information; it's listening. It's the opposite. It's it's creating mm. a space to listen mm -hmm. to the spirits. I yeah. think that, and yeah. and so much of that can be just crazy and probable. But if if you decide beforehand what you think that experience is going to be, there's no room for the actual thing to happen. Mm -hmm. That's such a great point. Such a great point, Harper. Again, listeners, I, I hope you appreciate that That um, as much as I do, which is make sure to manage your exp expectations of it, but also know that sometimes because, again, things are not only stranger than we imagine, they're stranger than we can imagine. So whatever Hollywood mm. fantasy is, you know, kind of being conjured up in your own mind, things will be stranger than that. Um, perhaps, mm. or or different, or mm. um, you'll maybe see. Do you find that too, Harper? This just popped into my head about um, you. You mentioned kind of taking a page out of good old Uncle Alistair there and <laughs> recording everything. <laughs> um, sometimes, uh, when you do record everything and you do go through a procedure, a scrying procedure, a ritualistic magical procedure. Does the do the answers to the questions? Does the information, if you will. Does it sometimes come immediately? Does it come a week later, a month later? Do you find that there are delayed? I, I'm using the word delayed temporally, mm -hmm. but there really is no delay. It's all the same. But like, are are is information revealed or shared 
even on a timeline or does it just totally depend on on the question that you're asking and the request hmm well i can only answer that for for myself personally so sure. it there's a whole variety of of that sort of temporal response that timeline if you will and i don't know if it's related to the type of question but i think I think it's more my processing of of the information. Mm. So sometimes it's like, <clears throat> all right. So we all have these books of of um, magical correspondences, right? Seven 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 or um, David Griffith has one. There's another couple. Anyway, these these correspondence books. Your head should kind of work like that, right? So you have. Oh. You know, like Mr. Velcro, you have the observation, and then you have some realizations later. Um, I doubt seriously if Mr. Velcro went home immediately and invented Velcro that very day. So there's some right. processing that we have to do with our own heads and our own experiences to come up with, oh, maybe that's what that means. And, you know, we're never really sure. Mm -hmm. But you know, in in case that bothers you a whole lot, we're we're not sure in real life if our conclusions are are salient. Even mm -hmm. if they're meaningful, it needs to be enough. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. and and so there there are workings that I have been part of, and I'm still trying to figure out what the fuck that meant. <laughs> Trust me on that, and I'm sure that's true for you, Alex, and I'm sure it's true for almost everyone who's listening. You do a thing, and you think about it, and at some point later, you think, maybe I understand a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you think some more, and you're like, ooh, maybe I didn't, right? Right. Absolutely. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's that's not esotericism. That's not occultism. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that's being a person. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that because that's been one of the themes of of what you've been sharing is is being in touch. Again, think about giving yourself permission to use intuition and nonlinear thinking. You know, go back to the ancient Greeks, like having mm. that ability to process things. You know, um, mm. I I love that. Absolutely love that, Harper. Would, uh, would, uh, so let me very briefly give an example of this. Oh, please, please. So. So I gave as as an exam uh, as an exercise. I gave to one of my classes not very long ago. The uh, I I gave them the exercise to go off and use Trithemius's ritual to conjure Michael mm. on Sunday, first thing in the morning. And it's like, how many times have I done this in my life? A lot, hundreds, maybe a lot. <laughs> and so I said to, I said to everyone in the class, okay. Let's make this dirt simple. Some of you don't have a bunch of money. Some of you don't have all, all the ritual toys. So we'll make all the ritual toys out of paper and wood. <clears throat> and in my head, I'm like, I'm going to standardize this, this experiment and see what happens. Yeah. So we all Excellent. made our stuff and we all did this ritual. And I, we decided, okay, we're not going to use a crystal ball because we didn't all have one. So mm -hmm. we're going to look for... We're going to scry incense smoke. Very, very, very traditional. Like, okay, we should all know how to do that. And so I'm in my own living room and I'm doing this ritual and I'm thinking oh, I'm just doing this because class and the weirdest, some of the weirdest shit happened to me. And the the thing that really got my attention was that I threw a bunch of incense on on the brazier and the fire went out. The coals went dead. And I'd Whoa. never seen that before, right? So experiment over. <clears throat> wow. And hmm. so I opened up the brazier later when it cooled off, and the material that I pulled out of my frankincense bag were pebbles. Hmm. So hmm. what do you do with that? And and um, for whatever reason, I fell into the biblical story where um, King Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the 
furnace and they didn't burn. There were three pebbles. Mm. And, and so, like, I'm not a card carrying Christian, really. And, but, but that story came into my mind. And I realized so th- the whole thing was about protection and about improbability and about impermeability and about mm-hmm. being indestructible. So, this, so there was an observation. Mm-hmm. And what came later is still evolving mm. for me. And so, what actually happened, if we think about the physics of the situation, <clears throat> is that there were rocks in my frankincense bag, but that turned into a really potent spiritual message to me. Absolutely. Yes. The, you the know? yep. The laws of meaning were in full effect because Mm, of, mm -hmm. and especially, I love that image, by the way. I mean, talk about a, uh, both with uh, the the three in the furnace, but also with your procedure about literally in both cases, say a direct um, celestial or or spirit interaction, interference message, however we want to want to phrase it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so we are conjuring an angel and the angel of the Lord, <clears throat> in the story at least, in I th- think it's in Daniel, mm-hmm. the angel of the Lord was the reason that those guys weren't were unharmed. You know the whole the whole mm-hmm. thing. Um, just uh, you know, a, a very a, a little experience, but I'm still processing it, and it's still providing meaning. So that's that's what I I mean about the separability of the observation and and the results. I'm still processing the results of of that little experiment that I did with my class. One hundred percent. And listeners, really, yes, very much so. And um, I again, I think that goes directly to the theme of don't. don't be so hard on yourself, you know, don't have these unrealistic expectations mm. of I need a Hollywood experience or or even no Hollywood <laughs> experience, but I want but I expect to have all of the information immediately mm. right away. I mean, this uh listeners, you know, you're you're hearing it from Harper herself about <laughs> um processing that. So I think if Harper's doing that, then that that would be a very good indication for our own mm. Mm. Idi- idiosyncratic requests um mm. as well. And Harper, speaking of, you just mentioned Tritemius and and some of the more traditional uh, approaches to things. And I love the standardizing uh, the experiment by making all of the magical <laughs> accoutrement mm, out of paper. Mm, That's just mm. such a great thing. Um, one of the things when it comes to kind of classic, quote unquote, uh, ceremonial magic procedures and whatnot uh, is something that David Rankin talks about and has written about as well uh, in his grimoire encyclopedia, where and I immediately thought of you when I when I read this, because David mm. um, gives a modified consecration of the scryer. Uh, that needs uh, to be done before yeah. a ritual. And David, when he was on the podcast, he was talking about, you know, it's important that you consecrate things people don't usually think about. You know, if you have any any rings on, your contact lenses, anything you bring <gasps> into the oh circle, <laughs> you need to consecrate. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I mean, I, I don't know. And then he gives this modified consecration of the scryer. So, uh-huh. What do you think, Harper? Do you think that um, that it's important for scryers themselves to be consecrated in addition to the o- other magical accoutrement that are present in, mm. a, in a ritual? Well, Any thoughts you know, on that? why not? So, uh, as we consecrate the incense, uh, oh, inanimate creature of God. So, uh, what's stopping us from saying, oh, animate creature of God? Mm-hmm. Of course, we should do that. We should uh, we should be constantly consecrating ourselves to our own work. I mean, b- above and beyond the whole scrying thing, mm-hmm. we've devoted ourselves to a spiritual path, and we should constantly be be acknowledging that, and and in so doing, consecrating our our efforts, ourselves, our body, ourselves, everything. I feel really strongly about that, and I'm not sure, but I think that's what Crowley meant when he advocated for his uh, his adherents to do uh, to take Eucharist every day. 
Mm, right? Do the, yeah. do the mass, right? Either do the Gnostic mass or the mass of the Phoenix every day. I'm pretty sure that's what he was getting at. Mm -hmm. is, con is consecrate yourself all the time. Just, we're, you know, gosh, I sound like Yoda. Spiritual beings are we. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and we yeah. should acknowledge that every moment that we can. I, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing because it goes to that point about reality being strange and beautiful and a miracle effectively mm -hmm. and just this wonderful thing. I love that, Harper. Love that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as well, I we we have some questions for you about um about collaboration and about different uh publications that you have too, but mm -hmm. uh Let's well, let me stick with science here a bit because we have a listener question for you from B, and B is asking and saying, Harper, how? And this is something you've touched on in mm. the la in the last uh, hour or so. But how do you balance? How do you balance your scientific and magical personas socially? B is saying, do you share any of your magical work, writing, or practices, or for that matter, the OTO with your colleagues I, I assume scientific colleagues or is it more of a mm. double life type of a scenario do you do you feel like chemistry or science generally has informed your magical practice or vice versa what's the overlap mm. between the two and i know that you touched on that but to mm. be's to be's first point is first i mean yeah how how do you balance that and with colleagues on on both sides of the of the spectrum if you will <laughs> Well, you know, so you've asked two very distinct questions. So I think I've answered the second one. So yes. for for me, um, science and magic have found an equilibrium in my life, in, in me. Those two things, um, I'm always doing them all at the same time. You can see how the way that I describe scrying and, and spiritual the pursuits in general is heavily uh, informed by my scientific path, my training at least. My scientific work is also heavily influenced by my magical work in that I'm very patient. I am a really keen observer. Um, and if if I have achieved some degree of notoriety in science, it's because I'm a really careful observer. And that actually came out of my magical practice. I am, but in, in terms of social, the, the, the question about how I interact in, in uh, society, I am two completely different people. And I, I will confess, let's see, um, the closest I've come to confessing um, my secret identity to the people at work is that one of my junior engineers takes care of my cats when I'm on travel. I travel a lot. But when she comes to take care of the cats, it takes me about three hours to prepare the house, right? She knows about my book collection, so she clearly has a pretty good idea of what she's dealing with. But all of the bones and all the magical implements, my enormous collection of knives, um, some of which who are not even mine, um, the, the skulls, all that stuff, it disappears into boxes. My statue, my statuary, I put it all away every time I travel and I need someone to take care of the cat. I am effectively, I'm two different people. I have the scientist part, a LinkedIn account and a Facebook account, all that stuff. And then I have the Harper Feist Landia <laughs> and everybody knows Instagram and Facebook and all this other stuff. I'm two people and it will never be any different. And, and I, I wonder sometimes, so facial recognition is so good that if the government must certainly know I'm too, I'm the same person and I'll never again get a security clearance. <laughs> Should I say that here? I don't know. I did. Hmm. Well, that is, that is the government's loss, uh, but that's, that's okay. Um, and I totally 
can understand that as well because I I also have that uh, mm. uh, kind of two different. I call it like when you're when someone's coming over or when you're getting ready to travel. I just call it like yeah, like putting the putting the ritual room and and the magical areas like putting it in a zip file. You know, just like putting it in a nice compressed dot zip. It, and it, it is. It, it's <laughs> password protected. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I love that question though, and and it's not. I don't really think the people I work with would be so surprised mm. at at some of it. Yeah. You know the the fact that I've actually cursed the fuck out of child abusers with lead tablets and actually had things happen. They would be surprised about that. They know that um, I have uh, that I study ancient Greek and Coptic. Mm. They know about some of the weird things I've read. A couple of them read the essay I wrote for Peter Mark Adams. Mm. I changed the name so they could, they could read it. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, that's the, you know, that's the only piece of my, my writing that my parents have ever seen. Ah. My family doesn't know. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Keeping mm. the importance of keeping those two spheres, making sure they're non mm. overlapping magisteria. Right. Indeed. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, the, 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 Venn the Venn diagram overlaps, but maybe by a, per a percent or two. Only. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and I, and I, I think like that question. <laughs> <laughs> same here. Same here. Love that, B. Uh, and mm. um, B also has a follow-up question for you because we also have some some questions from listeners that I think are great at kind of, you know, very uh, big picture kind of looking at the future of magic and esotericism as well. Um, but B, and this touches directly on your experience, Harper, is asking, how would you, Harper, compare or contrast AA training with modern magical schools and paths beyond just the one-on-one -on -one mm. instruction, are there places where you feel there's something the AA does that other systems are lacking or the other way around? Any, any thoughts on that? Oh, you're, oh man, I'm going to get in trouble here. I just know it. So I, I think the the AA for me has, has been really beneficial, but it's been really beneficial on the HOD line of things. Right. Since, since you brought that up. So the, the mercurial thinking and reading and processing the linear part, the rational part of magic, the history, the gematria, the tree of life, correspondences, all this kind of stuff. The AA has been absolutely, um, instrumental in me developing a symbol language. And, you know, I bet Agrippa said similar things when you talked to him, right? So we build a, a symbolic structure to operate within. That's absolutely necessary. And it, you know, people think, well, I have to start this way. Well, no, we all benefit from this kind of work. In this, it, it kind of in the same way that as a scientist, my, um, my education didn't finish when I got my PhD. I read constantly. I'm always in con uh, in contact with col my collaborators and my um, my competitors, actually, about this kind of stuff. It's a mapping, and it's a f it's a furtherance of our education. So the AA is really really good for the Hode structure, I think. Um, I don't know so very much about modern magical education, actually. I know um, kind of what's up at the Blackthorn School. I know that uh, nowadays you can learn anything from YouTube. Everybody has a class. This is why I'm kind of stepping away from it pretty soon, I think. Um, but I think that's, a, in some ways, it's probably similar education furthering and in some ways it's probably pretty different in that i hope at, i hope that m many of these classes grant permission to explore 
So I think, um, you know, uh, and that that's an incomplete answer to the question, but I think it's the best I can do out of ignorance. I hope that people are given permission to explore. This is this is what we need past the um, the establishment of being able to focus our minds on things and as, and the establishment of a symbol set. Hmm. That is a perfect, okay. uh, perfect answer that one would love and appreciate from a scientist, right? Is, is that lovely, <laughs> very well thought out, um, response. I think that's great Harper. And, um, you, you, uh, by the way, listeners check out the links in the video and podcast descriptions for all of Harper's, uh, excellent, publications and writings and also ways to support Harper. Um, we also have a question for you about your book um, from mm. the lovely uh, Jack Grail's Grail Press. You recently authored uh, uh, EO Typhon, a hymnal, and B is asking a question about this, Harper, saying, how did you come around to Typhon generally and then writing your new book do you find you need to do protective or limiting work when engaging with this type of being how would you expect preliminary work to play out in the world or the lives of someone who engages typhon especially for the first time so mm. yeah anything typhon uh, it's just, that uh, that's a lot of ground there um i got involved with typhon actually uh, after i watched uh, a movie and I watched the movie when maybe I was still a professor then. I'm not sure. But there are all these movies on YouTube. Encourage everybody to look just because they're cool. But when um, in a crowded city, when there is an empty building and somebody wants to put a new one where the old building was, they have to get rid of it. And how that's generally done is through a series of controlled explosions that cause the building to fall in upon itself. The building falls down and then they kind of scrape it off and they put a new building. And it occurred to me that, that the deity, I'm going to call him a deity, the deity Typhon governs this kind of thing. And I, th I think, um, you know, with without like going off at, going off the deep end, you can prove it to yourself historically or at least mythologically that Typhon prepares the ground for rebuilding. Yeah, you know, he's in in some ways he's um, a classic storm god, and he's certainly a god uh, that's associated with chaos. But in general, to me. He does what those explosives do. He prepares very busy situation for a new thing, right? The the earth is full of people. Um, the, you know, famously, there's a statement that's made in the movie The Matrix about how we're viral, we're viruses. We we don't know when to stop. We build and we build and we build. And so there's no, there's not a lot of place for new stuff for people. And it really occurred to me when I saw this movie of what the the building coming down. And trust me that I watch a lot of movies about explosions for reasons. <laughs> but um, I got interested in Typhoon because of that movie, and I wrote a poem about it in 2000, maybe eight or something about the preparation of the new place. The preparation of the new place is a social statement, it's a practical statement, it's a personal statement. And my invocation of Typhon was to prepare and is constantly to prepare me to receive new things. And with respect to that, um, I don't advocate this to everyone. This is the way I operate. I did not protect myself against any of this because I wanted it to operate on me. That is right. Don't, don't build yourself any boundaries between you and uh, an entity. If you want it to operate 
on you. If you want it to operate on someone else, different story. If you want it to operate on society in general, perhaps different story. You need to consider that as a practitioner. Me, I was naked before the force. And the naked before the force part of this is where the book came from. That is incredible. Um, the felt presence of direct experience and the vulnerability that I'm sensing there too, you know, just about placing yourself there without any, you know, consecrated circles traced by an iron blade or any kind of uh, defensive rearings or citadels uh, in the astral or, or here. Um, wow. Uh, that's incredible. Listeners check out uh, the, vi the video and podcast description. I know that frankly, I, I not sure if there's any copies left Harper. I guess we'll have, to, I'll have to check. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like there are very well. No, your Typhoon sold out. Um, the deluxe version sold out before it was even bound. The wow. the uh, standard edition sold out. I think two days after it was released at at Miskatonic, it's gone. Wow. And but let here here's the thing, right? There's never there's uh, nothing ever truly ends. If any listeners would like to have Yo Typhoon and don't have it, go to Miskatonic, go to the site where it's talked about, and ask to be notified when it's back in stock. Because if there are enough of you kind and generous people interested in wild people, crazy and, and extreme people, we'll do it again. But only if there are enough of you, because, you know, we want it to be worth everybody's while. And two, if we release a second edition of it, we will make it, uh, I will, we, we, me, and Typhon, we will make a new hymn. Ooh, so, wow. so, so there's a dare for you. But oh, you know, only if it's of interest to people, I'll leave it there. Uh oh, <laughs> fortune favors the bold. So check out the link in the podcast video description to head over to Miskatonic and to mm -hmm. to actually to make that ask. That sounds that really does sound uh, certainly like. I think we'll have many bold uh, thinking and bold minded um, listeners wanting that and asking for mm. that Harper for sure. Um, that would be the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So check out that link listeners. Um, Harper, I, I know uh, we definitely want to talk about, um, you know, obviously your, uh, your course as well as upcoming uh, projects, which you've already uh, intimated on as well. But before we get there, um, as we wrap up the scrying, um, section, because I have some kind of, uh, really big picture questions from our listeners that I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, but, um, as we wrap up the scrying section, um, uh, can you share about two or three things about scrying that, that maybe we haven't touched on yet that, that you think it's always just good for people to keep in mind, whether it's your students or, you know, people taking your course or people mm -hmm. thinking about scrying, any, <clears throat> anything else that, that we haven't touched on yet. Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll take you up on that. So two things, everything gets better when you practice hmm. and um, you can't practice unless you start. Hmm. Okay, that 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 would be number one, and number two is um, it's easier for me, and for a, a, a significant percentage of my students to not take this deadly seriously. Like uh, you know, we have to have fun with what we do. We all have day jobs. We have families. We have you know obligations, shitty and not. Let your practice not be that, right? We need to have this be cool. We need to have this be interesting and entertaining. And if you take the words interesting and entertaining and cool and you add them all up, it means fun. So, and, you know, fun, fun is considered to be a, a triviality, but, you know, why would you do it if it wasn't that? Just asking. 
So th- those would be the the two my two responses to that question. <laughs> Love that. Yes, yes. I'm I, I'm just. I'm just sitting here nodding because I'm just like, okay, this is, this is, these are lovely dusky gems uh, that I think we all need to have in our pockets. Mm. And thank you for, for reminding us of that. Um, (laughs) um, Really, really excellent. Harper too. uh, Okay. So going a bit more global or beyond, there are some mm-hmm. other some other questions we got from listeners for you that I think uh, I know that we have an after show, but before we get to to that, I, I really want to ask you these as well. We have a listener question for you from Jack Walter, who is asking and saying, "Do you Harper think the presence of modern technology mm-hmm. helps or hinders us in things like scrying, divination, or the practice of magic in general?" You know, Hmm. I'll I'll just turn it over to you. I mean, I'm thinking of everything (laughs) from AI to uh, just interconnectedness, social media, fasting, social media overload. I don't know. There's so many things. What Mm. do you what do you think? Uh, You know, so I I really liked I really liked this question and I I want to not answer it directly. But what I want to say is, you know, lots of us love the BGM. So here's here's a set of um, largely folk magic spells uh, workings that have to do with all these weird materia magica and, and and these weird god names that we don't understand and and all of this. Well, you know, so I love to play the game of moving the PGM forward into 2024. And so the scribes that wrote the PGM would have adored microwave ovens. They would have loved cars. There would be half of those spells would be about cars. Half of uh, the other half would be, you know, about pornography. So magic matches social needs in every case. And, and, you know, you want to get all nerdy and stuff. Well, um, most of magical history is about getting other people to do things for you and to think things and nothing is different in in that situation you could actually say well you know advertising executives are magicians <laughs> uh, did i just say ooh i dirty but but <laughs> but here's yeah. but but here's the thing we use yeah. what we have right we use what we have to create yeah. magic that we need mm-hmm. we don't do magic that we're we don't need for some reason and you know we have the tools we have we we don't get to go back and um you know buy the feet of hawks at the market what can we do instead well we can go to the chinese grocery and buy a chicken and cut its feet off for sure but is that even necessary it's like don't let don't let your practice get stuck in in the the second century CE and don't let it get stuck in the 14th century CE and don't let it get stuck in France and, you know, in, in the era of the sun King, Mm -hmm. let your magic resonate within you and your life and your house with all your stuff. Mm. Now, as an example, people in my advanced class right now, we decided we were going to visit each other astrally. And so we we do this all the time. It's super easy. You know, ask, ask me later, hold my beer, all that stuff. But this time we used AI to create images of our astral temples and we visited those. I don't think any of this stuff is in our way. It's up to us to figure out how to make use of it. Hmm. Isn't it? It's just, it's, it's, oh. it's the environment. We use a tree. We use our, uh, we use the front porch. We use the car. We use the neighbor's house. We use our basement. We use cat hair. We use the spoons in our kitchen. AI is the same. Computers are the same. The surface of the cell phone. Here I am again. Mm-hmm. Same. Hmm. It's a, these are our tools, and they're our environment, and therefore useful. Hmm. 
I love that reminder. I love that. And and even talking about getting stuck in the 14th, 15th, or 16th century, you know, there there are, for instance, very serious and and I think very good, say, people who are interested in um, Enochian, for example. Mm. Uh, however, you know, John D's wax table of practice, the mm-hmm. the table of practice, he to your point, he saw the technology from the Sworn Book of Honorius and the Summa mm. Sacra Magice, and he took that and imported it into an Elizabethan era, you know, working with Edward Kelly, Crystal Sphere thing. So mm-hmm. it, it, it sounds like that kind of fits your theme about no matter what century you're in, if you look at people who are even like D, very well known, it was about, or Dr. Rudd is another great mm-hmm. example, taking D and then modifying it, but yeah, at, at the technology, right? I mean, I mean, amplifying it, augmenting it, accentuating it, changing it, mollifying it, you know, it's, mm. it's just interesting. Well, and and nowadays, if if you wanna if you wanna do Enochian magic, you really ought to invest in a three D printer. Mm-hmm. No, I I mean, so it it yeah. it's it, there's yeah. an honor there's an honor in 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 doing things the the way that they've been presented, and you know, as practitioners, as it, it deepens our work to do it, things historically, but we shouldn't get stuck there. I think. Right. And 3D printers are so fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. And I, th- I think j- just like with, um, you know, the the targeted use, as, as you just uh, elucidated with AI, 3D mm. printers, same thing. I think we're just mm. scratching the surface in many ways. It's uh, a, it, it, look at it as a tool. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, think of ways to incorporate that into your practice. Why not? Otherwise, it's a, it's a last opportunity. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work, then just don't do it again. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is something that, oh, my goodness. I mean, you and, yeah, Frater Chassan, Frater Acher, Dr. Stephen Skinner, uh, pretty much it's like magic is, if it works, continue to use it. If it doesn't, discard mm. it uh it doesn't mean you hate the system it doesn't mean that mm. it's it's a it's an evil thing or a bad thing it just means that we all have our own paths that we're walking mm. in so what mm. what calls to you in, yeah. in that way you know? you know you know one one other thing to say about that yeah um, don't so and and this is me talking to me maybe don't try something once and then give up right yes yeah. yes so so if you're going to do an experiment and it doesn't work the first time, tweak it, try it again, or try mm-hmm. it again, tweak it, and and you know see if right if it if if the if whatever happened to you is reproducible, mm-hmm. right? I'm, I'm and don't expect for things to work the first time. Oh my God, it doesn't work for me. If if any of the the people in the, in the listening audience have things work. The first time we want to know about it because that doesn't work for the rest of us <laughs> right <laughs> sorry <laughs> we're stubborn and we keep we keep working on it and that's why we're where we are right right, right. yes <laughs> yes in fact i think even um and my goodness yourself and jack grail and and uh Dr. Skinner know far more than uh, I do, but I, I seem to recall that even if you look at the original PGM, you will, and you mm. you look at the scrolls of Egypt of you know magicians in Alexandria in the year you know two fifteen or something, and you can see where they call them experiments. I mean, these are called experiments, <laughs> but also it it even says in the two thousand year old magician writings, you know, mm. uh, spell X tried. 10 times worked eight out of 10 times, you know, like there's right. that, that scientific uh, method, if one may be so bold is found 2000 <laughs> years ago, you know, it, you know, that is so important. I'm so glad that you're leaning on that, Alex, you know, cause I, nothing y'all, nothing works the first time ever. And if it does, it's probably bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. You just you just heard it from Harper herself. Okay, so do not have the the craving for results that that seems to 
infect. I know it has with me for sure. Mm. You know, oh, I did all this preparation. I'm setting everything up perfectly. Now the fireworks start. Well, no, now <laughs> you go through the procedure, you record your results, and that's what's important. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 the use of the word fireworks, A+. <laughs> 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 Touche. Mm. Well, mm. even even Harper going out to an even bigger picture, um, mm-hmm. Michelle Rella Summers, who Michelle is great. Love Michelle. She's asking for you, Harper, as a magician and as a historian, how do you, Harper, see the state of the world within the next year? And what can we do to make it better? So how do you how do you see mm. things blossoming or unfolding or collapsing or transforming or however you'd phrase it uh, you know so that's an uncomfortable question mm. <clears throat> and therefore a super cool one and i think you know this this gets to a, like a, a definition of sphere of influence so i think I'm not so sure if the world is any shittier than it ever has been right now. So there are a lot of people constantly are like, you know, the world's on the edge of destruction and it's never been this bad, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, and I shouldn't say, I don't want to be dismissive about that. So I recant the blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing. I don't think the world is any worse now than it ever was. Human nature is the same. Um, the degrees of difficulty are perhaps different. You know, public health is really good now, so people don't die of cholera. So there's that. Um, people who die in warfare uh, it, it statistically are fewer than in in you know in the past. Certainly, um, man's inhumanity to man remains. You know, as brothers fight ye. Does that actually mean us fighting each other or with each other? So people love to fight. People love to complain. It, it, it seems to be an inveterate part of, of humanity itself. Mm. So it, it's, it's actually a really good beer conversation, whether the world is worse now than it has been mm. before. I, to me, I don't think it probably is. I operate on that assumption. I think other people should feel free to operate on different ones because they have different metrics about what's bad. Mm. Now, how uh, and that informs how I decide to improve my world. Mm. I improve my world by changing things that don't work for me. Typhoon, for example. But I also feel like my improvement of the world has to start at the core of me. And I have to be ethical and clear and compassionate. I have to do well by my family and my friends and help as many people as I can locally. Now, that's the occult side of me. The scientific side of me actually is is working really hard on helping um, recycle processes for for waste. Hmm. So, you know, m- m- my other interests are all in the improvement of the ecology and reuse of, of metals in, in particular. Hmm. So, I really think, you know, we need to start with ourselves as we talk about improving the world because... Um, you know, our our sphere of influence is really pretty small. Hmm. And that's very painful for people who who can see what's going on across the world. We know what's going on in Israel, and we know what's going on in the Ukraine. We know what's going on um, uh, in in China to some degree. We know what's we know what's happening. But can we touch that? I I don't know. And if we can touch it, it's not because of magic. It's because of our humanity and the beauty of our humanity and the softness of our humanity, or perhaps the fierceness. But 
we have to recognize that our sphere of influence is much smaller than the, the sphere of our understanding. And that would be the most painful thing about the modern world to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just seeing everything and mm. understanding to use, to use the, the phrase that you just said, you know, so many different factors, but yet the sphere would, would it be fair to say that based on what you just shared Harper, that, and to Michelle's point, exactly what you said that the best gift or, or the best presentation that you can make to participate in a stabilization, a vitalization, a revitalization, a healthy approach would be to look at your own sphere. Whatever falls in the circumference of your own sphere, mm. that's something that is worthy of attention and dedication and refinement and improvement. Mm. And and I think you know to to kind of you know tie the the whole of the conversation together. Listening is is that thing. And we need to listen to one another, certainly, as as humans, but we need to listen to the spirits of place and the spirits of time. And we need to listen to the the voices that are present for us in 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 locations and in things. And this this radical listening oh. is is super important here. And I think scrying actually has a place in all of this because it teaches us to settle and ask a question and without any expectations, be prepared to to hear the answer. Ah, oh, love that. Love that. This actually gets to... Uh, this just popped into my head, Harper, but it's something I think we mm. mentioned we would uh, we would touch on is, I mean, look, you, whether it's Peter Mark Adams, uh, Frater Acher, uh, your collaborations with him, Jack Grail, I can say, and I and I don't know if if the other two participants in this would want to be uh, identified, but I can personally say, listeners, I have benefited greatly uh, from Harper's own inventions, magical insights and recommendations while working with in the forest with multiple times with two other uh, fellow colleagues magically and collaborating in the wilderness and one of the first things that one of these magical colleagues did to your point harper was make make an offering to the spirits of the place and and mm. asking permission and yeah, utilizing exactly. the elements right it's just can you just talk about that whether it's uh um the importance of collaborating as you have done with so many other magical <laughs> colleagues, um, but also just echoing that importance of never forgetting that, yes, you do occupy a place, an environment, a locale, some kind of constellation of elements. Hmm. You know, it just, it just globally. And I feel like I'm, I'm shorting all of the people that you just mentioned and, and some others, but we're part, all of us, me, Alex, all of the guys that you talked to about, all of the people that I work with in the order, we're part of a net. Mm. And the the net is, is certainly human. But, you know, I I personally think, as I've said before, right, we, we've evolved to be communicating entities. We communicate with one another sometimes sweetly and sometimes um, nastily. We communicate with the spirits of place, whether we like it or not. What do you do with your trash? What do you, you know, how do, how do you, um, do you have a lawn or do you have a bee garden? All, all this kind of stuff. We make decisions that matter to the beings that are close to us. And that net is what, it, it it fulfills us. It creates us. It you know it it binds us to our humanity, but also to something larger. And you know all the all the people that I work with on on the esoteric end of things, they make me who I am. Mm. The people I work with on the scientific end of things, I would be nothing without. We stand on on the shoulders of giants. But recognize that people are standing on your shoulders too, 
and are linked arm in arm, uh, hmm. you know, in in this un unbreakable chain of of life and of communication that we need to we need to pay attention to, and, and not like uh, you know, I'm not nagging anybody, and this is not me preaching. I think I'm just saying a thing that we all actually know. You know, we yeah. should pay attention to that. And when someone tugs on your elbow or the guy standing on your shoulders is uncomfortable, we know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when and, and you know, it, when you're standing on the shoulders of someone brilliant, you know, like like Aha, like like Jack, like Peter, you know, and and count and countless others. When those guys are uncomfortable, we know. I know. Mm-hmm. The, the, and and in in the doing, they're my teachers. In the doing, they're my colleagues. Mm. In the doing, they're my environment. I can do nothing without uh, without all these guys on the esoteric end of things, and also you know the science science dudes. And and everybody's the same. You, Alex, you're the same. You you have a family. You have a job. You have a place. And you know you have all these inanimate objects that actually are also talking to you. It's a whole different conversation. And people think I'm crazy about that. We have an environment that we're part of, mm-hmm. and and this radical listening, um, it makes us. Tightens the net, mm. threading the mesh of that mm. net. That's uh-huh. that's that's so lovely. Um, what a, what a powerful reminder! Thank you, thank you, Harper, for sharing that. Uh, I know it's something that I need to constantly keep in mind, um, as well as the sphere of influence uh, too. So, um, well, Harper, I mean that was such fantastic. I mean, really, listeners, I hope you appreciate that as much as I do. Harper, by the time this podcast comes out, uh, it'll be like mid mid May. So, mm-hmm. can you can you tell us <clears throat> about the excellent scrying course that you have? And of course, listeners, check out the links in the podcast and video description below. But what would you like listeners to know about the course, about registration, about anything and everything? Mm. Well, you know, if it's mid-May by the time it comes out, um, registration will be close to closing. So we'll probably, it's the 8th of May today, and we'll probably close registration in a week or two, week and a half probably. Um, uh, Currently, the foundational scrying class that I'm teaching is just in the get to know you phase. (laughs) (laughs) We haven't done anything really nuts yet. That comes later. Um, people will, you know, if if they hear this and they think, "Oh my God, I can't live without that," you know, we'll let you in. And it, you know, there will be plenty of time. And of course, with the Blackthorn School, all the videos are um, available in perpetuity, and the uh, the exercises will be present in a Facebook group. I, you know, and and who knows when Zuckerberg gets gets tired of playing with us, all it will it will all disappear. But until then, it will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I I kind of think that's it about the class. Um, I'm after after this cohort, I'm going to go in. I, I'm going to take a sabbatical away from it to focus on a little writing and a bunch of ritual. And a potential move to Europe. My my professional life is changing. My personal life is changing. I'm so delighted, and um, I have a bunch of work to do. <laughs> well, that is so lovely, uh, and uh, also, like you said, with the class, you know, I, I know listeners. Whether it's you know for this for registration or or for any potential future opportunities, they will mm-hmm. keep their ear to the ground because. Uh, we were talking about this before, but uh, McKinley Valentine was asking in all caps, when is her next scrying course opening <laughs> up? I'm ready to pounce. Um, oh, so, well, it's, so McKinley has pounced. Yes. So she's all taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think I, I think McKinley exactly echoes yeah, the, the yeah. thoughts of, of many, many listeners as well. Um, OK, so as we wrap up the main podcast, Harper, of course, uh, <clears throat> please check the links listeners below. 
you've intimated, of course, you're, you know, working on your next book. You're always working on on something, whether it's thinking about different issues, a new project, a new a new mm. book. Can you give us, in addition to what you've shared earlier, can you give us any additional hints on up on upcoming projects, mm. uh, esoteric issues, anything capturing your interest right now? Uh, two two chief things. So I have an essay that I'm just finishing up for uh, an an issue of a, a how do you even put this it's it's a a collection put out by three hands press on necromancy and i have uh hopefully i, I think it's been accepted uh, a piece that i wrote about a homeric magic uh series that it, that i've been up to for about three years so mm -hmm. th that's the newest thing that i'm working on um writing wise <clears throat> the 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 book i'm putting out um hopefully soon with Llewellyn is about scrying and it will contain a bunch of the ideas that we've talked about here um <laughs> even even the the little story about velcro <laughs> and and um so aha and i are um doing all sorts of nifty things too in including um, rights in the mountains and that kind of stuff. And that will uh, blossom into things that we'll write about in due time. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> well, then I think that leads to the final question, which is, of mm -hmm. course, ways that listeners can support you, Harper. So, of course, check the links below for links mm -hmm. to all of Harper's books. Listen to Thelema now, obviously. Harper's mm -hmm. incredible. <laughs> Whether it's on <laughs> online courses, but how how else can people uh, obviously links below to your website, uh, Harper? But how else can listeners uh, support you? Is there anything else that you'd like to share with with listeners? Hmm. You know the the one last thing that strikes me is that a um, year and a half ago, I decided I needed and I needed to do a, a little creative thing every day. And that turned into my Instagram account, which has some photography in it. And if people, so, you know, there's all the writing and then there's the thinking and, and the class and all that stuff. But um, if people would like to go and see my photographs, uh, you know, that would, that would be cool. And I'm not saying that I'm good at this. It's all a work in progress, certainly. But I would be honored to have people uh, go and look at the things that um, I'm taking pictures of. And I have a, a bunch of uh, a quirky little movies in there. So uh, I, I'm a little nervous to to, to pump that, but I, I, on, by the same token, I'm kind of proud. So check that out. <laughs> <laughs> So lovely. And that will be below, <laughs> listeners. So please, mm -hmm. please check that out. Um, my goodness. Uh, scryer, esotericist, author, historian, scientist, Harper Feist. Harper, I cannot mm. express to you truly how um, fortunate and how thankful I am and appreciative that you would take the time to share with the listeners about all mm. of your thoughts, your wisdom, and your experience. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, mm. really. Thank you for the invitation, Alex. Uh, the, the questions that you've asked <clears throat> and, that, and that your audiences have asked, incredibly deep and probing and personal and revealing, and I've enjoyed every second of this. Thank you.